Hello and welcome to Earth Science, Lecture 31, The Formation of the Solar System. What did our solar system look like before the planets were fully formed? The answer may lie in these remarkable images from the Hubble Space Telescope. Each image shows an immense disk of gas and dust surrounding a young star. Astronomers strongly suspect that in its infancy, our own sun was surrounded by a similar disk from which the planets of our solar system eventually coalesced. Our theory of solar system formation is important, not only because it helps us understand our cosmic origins, but also because it holds the key to understanding the nature of the planets. So I just want to draw attention to this one on the right here. So this is actually a fairly recent image, uh, as in, I think it was taken in the last two or three years. But what you're, actually, what you're really looking at is the formation of our solar system. We can see the hot central object, which will eventually become a star. And then you see these kind of dark concentric rings. Well, what you're actually looking at is planets that are starting to form. And as they orbit, they're sweeping up the material along their path. In other words, they're carving out little paths um, as they orbit this forming star. So they may eventually become planets. So this is one of the most remarkable images, I think, in all of astronomy to date. Of course, perhaps aside from the new black hole image that was recently released, but I stand aside from that. So, the nebular theory begins with the idea that our solar system was born from the gravitational collapse of an interstellar cloud of gas, called the solar nebula, that collapsed under its own gravity. The solar nebula probably began as a large, roughly spherical cloud of very cold and very low-density gas. Initially, this gas was probably so spread out, perhaps over a region of a few light years in diameter. Gravity alone may not have been strong enough to pull it together and start its collapse. Instead, the collapse may have been triggered by a cataclysmic event, such as the impact of a shockwave from the explosion of a nearby star, in other words, a supernova. Once the collapse started, gravity enabled it to continue. The mass of the cloud remained the same as it shrank, so the strength of gravity increased as the diameter of the cloud decreased. In other words, you're just compacting more mass into a smaller area, and so the gravity will become stronger. Because gravity pulls inward in all directions, you might at first guess that the solar nebula would have remained spherical as it shrank. Indeed, this idea that gravity pulls in all directions explains why the sun and the planets are spherical. However, we must also consider other physical laws that apply to a collapsing gas cloud in order to understand how orderly motions arose in our solar nebula. So let's take a step through everything that happened in the formation of our solar system. And it came in a number of different ways. Um, I accidentally had some more animations there, sorry. So, as this enormous cloud of dust and gases collapsed, gravitational energy was converted into energy of motion, and that into thermal energy, in other words, heat, causing the contracting gases to speed up and greatly increase in temperature. This is a process technically known as Kelvin-Helmholtz contraction. As an analogy, when you drop a ball, the gravitational attraction of Earth makes the ball fall faster and faster as it falls just like matter falling into the center of the solar nebula. Most of the material in the solar nebula collected in the center, where the temperatures were hottest, forming the protosun, that is, the part of the solar nebula that would eventually develop into a sun. The planets formed from the much sparser material in the outer regions of this solar nebula. Indeed, the mass of all the planets together is only 0.1% of that of the sun's mass. After about 100,000 years, the protosun's surface temperature stabilized at about 6,000 degrees Kelvin, but the temperature in its interior would continue to increase. As the newly created protosun continued to contract and become denser, its temperature continued to climb as well. Eventually, after perhaps 10 million years had passed since the solar nebula first began to contract, the gas at the center of the protosun reached a density of about 13 times that the density of typical iron. In other words, 10 to the 5 kilograms per meter cubed. And a temperature of a few million degrees Kelvin. 
Under these extreme conditions, nuclear reactions that convert hydrogen into helium began in the pro protosun's interior. These nuclear reactions released energy that significantly increased the pressure in the protosun's core. When the pressure built up enough, it stopped further contraction of the protosun, and a true star was born. In fact, the onset of nuclear reactions defines the end of any protostar and the beginning of a new star. Nuclear reactions continue to the present day in the interior of our sun and are the source of all the energy that the sun radiates into space. So the solar nebula heated up enough to form our sun in the center, but it also rotated. If the solar nebula had not been rotating at all, everything would have fallen directly into the protosun, leaving nothing behind to form planets. Instead, the solar nebula must have had an overall slight rotation, which caused its ev uh, evolution to follow a different path. As the slowly rotating nebula collapsed inward, it would naturally have tended to rotate faster. This relationship between the size of an object and its rotation speed is an example of a principle in physics known as conservation of angular momentum. As a good analogy, since we haven't had much physics background in most cases, a figure skater is a perfect analogy. Figure skaters make use of the conservation of angular momentum. When a, skinny, when a spinning skater pulls her arms and legs in close to her body, the rate at which she spins automatically begins to increase. In the same way, the solar nebula spun more rapidly as material contracted toward the center. As the solar nebula began to rotate more and more rapidly, it also tended to flatten out. But why? Well, from the perspective of a particle rotating along with the nebula, so imagine you're in this nebula rotating around faster and faster. It felt as though there was a force pushing the particle away from the center of the uh, uh, solar nebula. Quite like passengers on a merry-go-round or a spinning carnival ride seem to feel a force pushing them outward away from the center. This apparent force was directed opposite to the inward pull of gravity, and so it tended to slow the contraction of material toward the center. But there was no such effect opposing contraction in a direction parallel to the rotational axis. In other words, say vertically. So some 100,000 years after it began to first contract, the solar nebula developed a structure with a rotating, flattened disk surrounding what would become the protosun. This disk is what is called a protoplanetary disk, since planets formed from its material. This model explains why their orbits all lie in essentially the same plane, and why they all orbit the sun in the same direction, because they all formed from the same spinning disk. So here's just a slide to kind of uh, cover everything we discussed. So we start out with the solar nebula. It begins to slightly rotate and collapse. As it rotates, it rotates more and more quickly, and it starts to flatten out into a disk. From that disk, we see planets start to form and the sun form in the middle. And ultimately, we see an image like we just started with in this lecture, uh, a forming solar system. And here's just another look at some other protoplanetary disks we, that we have taken a picture of. So you can see the inset of four of them here uh, at varying angles of viewing. The Orion Nebula is what we call a star-forming region, located some 1,500 light-years from Earth. The smaller bluish nebula is the object shown uh, above is NGG 1973, uh, 75, and 77. The four insets are false color close-ups of four protoplanetary disks that lie within the nebula. A young, recently formed star is at the center of each of these disks. The inset at the lower left shows the size of our own solar system for comparison. So we now know that we have this disk of hot material with a star forming at the center. Well, that's great. So how exactly do we get the planets? And why do we get them in the way that we see them today? So that will be the remainder of this lesson. To understand how the planets, asteroids, and comets formed, we start by considering a cold and low-pressure solar nebula before it was warmed by the emerging protosun. At the low pressures that prevailed, a substance does not form into a liquid state, but it must 
exist either as a solid or gas. An example of such a solid is in this figure on the right. This highly magnified image shows a microscopic dust grain that came from interplanetary space. It entered Earth's upper atmosphere and it was collected by a high-flying aircraft. Dust grains of this sort are abundant in star-forming regions. These tiny grains were also abundant in the solar nebula, and served as the building blocks of planets. Other substances in the early solar nebula would have been in the form of small ice crystals like snow, although at higher temperatures. Uh, these ices would evaporate at higher temperatures and form a gas. But together, these solids, referred to as ices, dust grains, and ice-coated dust grains, were mixed with gaseous hydrogen and helium. But, then things began to heat up. The churning and mixing of gas in the solar nebula should have ensured that the nebula had the same composition throughout, roughly 98% hydrogen and helium, plus 2% heavier elements. So then, how did the terrestrial planets end up so different from the Jovian planets? We first need to understand the condensation temperature, which determines when a substance forms a solid or a gas. If the temperature of a substance in the solar nebula is above its condensation temperature, then it is a gas. In other words, it isn't cool enough to condense. On the other hand, if the temperature is below the condensation temperature, the substance will condense or solidify into tiny specks of dust and icy frost. You can often see similar behavior on a cold morning. The morning air temperature can be above the condensation temperature of water, while the cold windows of a parked car may have temperatures below the condensation temperature, and thus, water molecules in the warmer air remain as a gas, but they form solid ice particles or frost on the colder car windows. The temperature in the nebula varied significantly, rising above 2,000 degrees Kelvin closer to the hot protosun and dropping below 50 degrees Kelvin in the outermost regions. Terrestrial planets formed in the warm, inner regions of the swirling disk, while Jovian planets formed in the cooler, outer regions. With heat from the emerging protosun, the solar nebula was radically changed into two distinct regions. These regions, we'll call them inner and outer, had very different properties and eventually formed very different planets. So the inner region, where rock and metal is mostly found, uh, so we have this region, it's a hot inner region uh, of the solar nebula. Uh, only substances with high condensation temperatures could have remained solid. These rocky and metallic materials, in the form of solid dust grains, eventually formed much of the rock and metal of the terrestrial planets. Hydrogen compounds, such as water, methane, and ammonia, remained as gas. In other words, they could not condense into solids in the warmer inner solar system. So, this is really, really important. Um, so you can see here these different uh, compounds and materials and the temperatures at which they condense. So note 150 degrees Kelvin is negative 190 Fahrenheit. 500 to 1300 Kelvin is 440 to 1880 degrees Fahrenheit. And 1,000 to 1,600 Kelvin is 1,340 to 2,420 uh, Fahrenheit. So the idea here is that only rocks and metals could remain as solid. Our hydrogen compounds stayed as gases because it was too warm for them to reach a condensation temperature. So we only had rocks and metals in the inner part of the solar system. But in the area between the present-day orbit of Mars and Jupiter, the temperature dropped below 170 or 150 degrees Kelvin. In the low pressures of the solar nebula, this is the condensation temperature at which water vapor forms ice. One aspect of this snow line, as we call it, that is the distance from the sun at which water vapor solidifies into ice or frost, is that beyond this line, the solid ice particles can join with the rocks and metals to result in more mass that can build a planet. So farther out, at even colder temperatures, methane and ammonia could also begin to form ices. And so what we're finding is that after a certain distance in our solar system, 
it was not just rocks and metals, but rocks, metals, and ices as well. So there was more material there to form planets. So here's just a way to visualize this. This graph shows how temperature probably varied across the solar nebula as the planets were forming, and the present day positions of the planets. Note the general decline in temperature with increasing distance from the center of the nebula. Between the present day distances of Mars and Jupiter, the snow line, marked where the temperatures were low enough for water to condense and form ice, is, uh, and beyond about 16 AU, methane could condense into ice as well. In the image on the right, terrestrial planets formed inside the snow line, where the low abundance of solid dust grains kept the planets small. The Jovian planets formed beyond the snow line, where solid ice and water, or solids of ice, water, uh, methane, and ammonia added their masses to build larger cores and attract surrounding gas. So really, the reason we have two distinct uh, classes of planets, excuse me, is simply because of temperature the condensation temperature of water and other gases. So now that we have this distinction, let's discuss more specifically how we got each planet in a little bit more detail. So from this point, the story of the inner solar system seems fairly clear. The solid seeds of metal and rock in the inner solar system ultimately grew into the terrestrial planets that we see today. But these planets ended up relatively small in size, because rock and metal made up such a small amount of the material in the solar nebula. The processes by which small seeds grew into planets is called accretion. Accretion began with the microscopic solid particles that condensed from the gases of the solar nebula. These particles orbited the forming sun with the same orderly circular paths as the gas from which they condensed. Individually, uh, particles therefore moved at nearly the same speed as neighboring particles, and so collisions were more likely gentle touches than violent processes. Although these particles were far too small to attract each other gravitationally at this point, they were able to stick together through electrostatic forces, that is, the same static electricity that makes hair stick to a comb. Small particles thereby began to combine into larger ones. As the particles grew in mass, gravity began to aid in the process of their sticking together, accelerating their growth into boulders large enough to count as planetesimals, which means pieces of planets, with diameters of about one kilometer. The planetesimals grew rapidly at first. As they grew large, they had both more surface area to make contact with other planetesimals and more gravity to attract them. Some planetesimals probably grew to hundreds of kilometers in size, in only a few million years. That is a long time in human terms, but only about one thousandth of the present age of the solar system. However, once planetesimals reached these relatively large sizes, further growth actually became more difficult. Gravitational encounters between planetesimals tended to alter their orbits, particularly those of smaller planetesimals. With different orbits crossing one another now, collisions between planetesimals tended to occur at higher speeds and hence became more destructive. Such collisions tended to shatter planetesimals rather than help them grow. Only the largest planetesimals avoided being shattered and could grow into our terrestrial planets that we see today. And so at this point, I'm going to, oh, I'm going to try to let this video play. Uh, so I've linked uh, where I got this video from. Uh, so this is just a great simulation of a planetary system forming. Uh, so this is not real. It's a simulation, but it's our pretty good supercomputer model of it. So here we see the solar nebula as a disk. And that disk begins to kind of warp and change shape and form these little chunks. So clumps of matter are getting stuck together. And so you're starting to see these planetesimals forming, these redder and orange little balls that you see orbiting the center. And so you'll see that eventually some of those may collide with one another, as you just saw right there around the center. Um, and so these could eventually become the planets that we know today, or the planets of some random imaginary solar system um, made in this simulation. So this just gives you a quick glance at how this can work. So this is our pretty straightforward way of explaining how the inner planets formed. They simply 
grew together via accretion. They smashed into each other, got bigger and bigger, and now we have our terrestrial planets. But that doesn't necessarily account for the Jovian planets. Accretion should have also occurred similarly in the outer solar system, but condensation of ices meant both that they were more solid, or that there was more solid material, and that it contained ice in addition to metal and rock. The solid objects that reside in the outer solar system today, such as comets and the moons of Jovian planets, still show this ice-rich composition. However, the growth of icy planetesimals cannot be the whole story of Jovian planet formation, because quite clearly the Jovian planets contain large amounts of hydrogen and helium gas. So what's the difference? Well, the leading model, which is known as the core accretion model, for Jovian planet formation holds that these planets formed as gravity drew gas around ice-rich planetesimals, much more massive than Earth. Because of their large masses, these planetesimals had gravity strong enough to capture some of the hydrogen and helium gas that made up the vast majority of the surrounding solar nebula. This added gas made their uh, gravity stronger, allowing them to capture more gas. Ultimately, the Jovian planets accreted so much gas that they bore little resemblance to the icy seeds from which they grew. Due to the lower temperatures in the outer solar system, Jupiter's large seed mass could capture and retain hydrogen and helium gas. This picture is again called the core accretion model. As Jupiter grew, its gravitational pull increased, that gave it the ability again to capture more gases and grow into bigger and bigger um, sizes. Because hydrogen and helium was so abundant, in other words 98% of the solar nebula, uh, Jupiter quickly grew to more than 300 Earth masses. Farther out in the solar nebula, Saturn would have gone through a similar process. About one-third the mass of Jupiter, Saturn's 95 Earth masses would have also taken uh, a long time to accumulate, forming a few million years after Jupiter. Uranus and Neptune formed well beyond the snow line, where temperatures were cold enough for additional ices of carbon dioxide, methane, and ammonia to form the bulk of these planets. This model also explains most of the large moons of the Jovian planets. The same processes of heating, spinning, and flattening that made the disk of the solar nebula should have, al should have also affected the gases drawn by the gravity of the young Jovian planets. Each Jovian planet came to be surrounded by its own disk of gas, spinning in the same direction as the planet rotated. Moons that accreted from ice-rich planetesimals within these disks ended up with nearly circular orbits going in the same direction as their planet's rotation and lying close to their planet's plane of uh, orbit. However, the Jovian planets uh, also have smaller bodies, called irregular satellites, that happened to orbit in the opposite direction, and as such, these were probably captured after the planet's formation. In other words, they didn't form with the planet, they were captured by their gravity later on. The vast majority of the hydrogen and helium gas in the solar nebula never ended up being become or never ended up becoming part of any planet. So what happened to it? Well, apparently it was cleared away by a combination of intense radiation from the young sun and the solar wind that is, the stream of charged particles continually blowing outward in all directions from the sun. Although the solar wind is fairly weak today, observations show that stars tend to have much stronger winds when they are young. The young sun therefore also had a strong solar wind, strong enough to have swept away huge quantities of gas out of the solar system. The clearing of the gas sealed the compositional fates of our planets. During the first few hundred million years of its existence, the solar system had a dynamic and violent history. This was a period of intense bombardment, as the planets cleared their orbits by collecting much of the remaining leftover material. The, quote, scars of this period are still evident on the moon's surface today. Because of the gravitational effects of the planets, particularly Jupiter, small bodies were flung into planet-crossing orbits or interstellar space. The small fraction of interplanetary matter that survived this violent period became either asteroids or comets, the latter residing mainly in the outer reaches of the solar system.
So let's end this lecture with just one single question. What is the theory that describes the formation of the solar system? Okay, so if you paid attention, hopefully you know the answer, but there is one that people often choose even though it's incorrect. Many choose the Big Bang Theory because that's what they're used to. Note that is the theory of the formation of the universe, not the solar system itself. Our theory here is the nebular theory. This is the one that we discussed in the first half of our lecture. So, as always, thanks for watching, and have a great day.